Howdy. Hey, let's face it, animation's expensive. All those pastels, colors, scripting, editing, and voice acting, that costs money that Nickelodeon is not willing to spend. What we need is something quick, easy, and with flashy effects and unfathomably bad acting. But most importantly, cheap. Enter the dreaded Nickelodeon sitcom. A place where teen actors go to read out painfully unfunny scripts, followed by a barrage of so much canned laughter that you will likely be driven to question the maddening terror that is your life within 15 seconds of watching. And of course, all actors are contracted to give the absolute worst acting performances of their lives. It takes a special kind of awful to make this list. The Nickelodeon sitcom generally has to be of such cataclysmically poor quality that it somehow lowers the quality of life of the viewers watching and any teenagers acting in it. While there has occasionally been some Nick sitcoms over the years that have brought us memorable, endearing, unique characters with some relatable teen stories. These mostly consist of, well, Drake and Josh, Victorious and iCarly. So let's check out the top six worst modern Nickelodeon sitcoms. If the Nickelodeon sitcom is made after 2010, it's allowed on the list. And to keep things fresh, I'll be excluding all the Nick sitcoms I've talked about before. And to any actors of these shows, please understand I'm not criticizing you as a person, just the shows you're acting in. Maybe you had bad directors or you had to do it all in one take. I don't know, but I hope you keep trying and go on to do better, greater things. Anyway, on to the countdown. <laughs> Nikki, Ricky, Dicky, and Dawn. Okay, seriously, what kind of horrible parent names their kid Dicky? That's like an even worse name for your child than Nigel. Now, you may claim I'm a complete jerk for making fun of sitcoms with child actors, and, well, you're probably right. But the acting from these kids is just so mind-blowingly terrible. It's like watching a friend's son-daughter school play, except rather than reciting the Declaration of Independence, all the kids are yelling and trying to be funny at the same time. You may want to smile, but you're so enveloped by a sea of awkwardness that all you can do is count down the minutes until this cruel and unusual torture is over. So the story is, is that these four kids are troublemaking quadruplets. And that's it, really. Most of the time we're watching these 11-year-olds awkwardly spout poorly written dialogue and get up to incredible antics like throwing foam at each other. Would anyone beyond a seven-year-old actually laugh at Throwing foam. There's no comedy timing to it, there's no cleverness to it, it's just throwing foam. And occasionally, if you're really lucky, you might get a scene of a building for a few seconds not trying to act, and they are sweet, sweet moments of peace from the torture. Now, I know they're only kids, but surely, surely child actors don't all have to overact so badly that you feel like gnawing your own arm off within 20 seconds of their performance. Sounds like quality family time to me. Am I right? Up top! <laughs> Every time they yell or try to act and the soulless canned laughter plays without a second's hesitation, I just can't stop asking how any audience could not find this torture. Despite Nicky, Ricky, Dicky and Dawn being among the worst Nick sitcom acting I've ever seen, this one's at the start of the list because, well, they're only kids. Game Shakers. Game Shakers is well remembered by many for being a milestone in Scream! the downfall of Dan Schneider's career. It's not as offensively bad as some of the others, but Schneider's original comedic timing is gone, and the characters, as hard as they're trying, just don't have that former Schneider memorability. As for positives, well, the acting's Better than Nicky, Ricky, Dicky, and Dawn? Though I suppose that's like saying a searing oven's cooler than an inferno. If exposed to either, both are still likely to leave permanent damage. 
Game Shakers honestly feels like a cut down inferior version of iCarly. And that's the problem with this one. The skits and scenes all feel rehashed and leave no impact. I watched the first few episodes twice and I can barely remember anything beyond a kid rolling around in peanut butter and a rapper jumping on a trampoline. I actually don't mind the characters in Game Shakers because it feels like they're actually trying. And there's a certain warmth to this one that does redeem it a bit. The story's basically some 7th graders start a new game app company called Game Shakers. They partner with a rapper and the usual Schneider antics ensue. I don't hate this one because honestly the characters are much more charming than someone like Henry Danger. Some are still annoying and it's not greatly acted, but it's an improvement over Henry Danger. I think it's okay if this one sticks on the network, but I won't be tuning into it anytime soon. Uh, we gotta use the bathroom! Right! We do! All three of you have to use the bathroom together. Uh-huh. Hudson needs our help! I get confused! <laughs> How to rock! Well, let's start with the performances. I wouldn't normally draw so much attention to the acting, but the problem with these Two Cent Nick sitcoms is that the acting is so appalling that you can't help but focus your attention on it. I still think she looks kind of ow. <laughs> perfect. You look perfect, not ow. And that's the frustrating part of these. Whenever I try to focus on the concept or the story or the message of these shows, these excessively blinking, heavily breathing teen actors keep bombarding me with the most cringeworthy performances possible. The story of How to Rock is that a popular girl named Casey loses her popularity after she has to wear braces, but regains that respect by becoming a pop singer. You feeling fabulous? Put your hands up. You could be you, I could be me. The songs themselves are average at best, and they feel far more like an attempt for Nick to cash in on selling iTunes singles than an artistic addition to the show. I don't mind the message of an unpopular teenager being judged for who she is rather than by appearance, but the problem is, is that the message is not subtle. Like most of the teen sitcoms, the message is shoved down our throats until we gag and drown in our own phlegm. I feel like this setup could be done well, but the problem is that the characters are written so flat and two-dimensional that I don't think the teen actors could make a good performance out of these roles. You've got the mean, shallow girls, the dull, pretty boy love interest, the two comic reliefs, and a goofy white guy, and poor Chris O'Neill. Despite, in my opinion, giving the best performance on the show, it feels like he's the tacked-on token African-American. I don't mind How to Rock's concept, but it's still got all the sins of the standard dreaded Nickelodeon teen sitcom in spades. Ah! Hi Casey. Ah! Ah! Out of the way! Ah! Bella and the Bulldogs. There's little about Bella and the Bulldogs that doesn't fit into a has-been stereotype show. Bella leaves the cheerleaders and joins the football team and <gasps> what a shock, because she is a girl. Will the football team accept her? Haven't we kind of got past this? Weren't female footballers only unusual in the 90s maybe? And like any terrible Nick sitcom, the laugh track of course lingers like a bad smell. So excited for this week! <laughs> Seriously, what was funny about that? Was there any valid reason to have the laugh track there at all? I'm so excited for this week! <laughs> it wasn't even a well-delivered line. Again, the acting's still marginally better than Ricky. But what bothers me so much is the way the show continually slams its weak girl empowerment message into your face with no room for subtlety. And she's gonna bat her eyelashes and tug at your heartstrings the way that you females are so good at. Football is too dangerous for a girl. If anything, it feels like it's speaking down to young women, not crediting its demographic with the intelligence to pick up subtle messages. While Bella and the Bulldogs isn't going to cause any harm, I think both women and men deserve better. Hello? <laughs> Bucket and Skinner's Epic Adventures. What's up? How you doing? <sighs> This one. Imagine the most annoying, loud class clowns in your old high school. 
Now give them red cordial, a bunch of stupid humiliating costumes, and tell them to yell out whatever they feel like on camera. At least that scenario would be real and not badly acted at the same time. I don't actually think Bucket and Skinner were asked to act. I suspect the director just asked them to stare at the camera looking constipated for 22 minutes and just film the results. Most of the skits aren't even attempts at dialogue driven humour. Half the time they're just dressing the poor teens up in embarrassing get ups and then just telling them to jump around frantically. Even Disney sitcoms know that The Idiot is not a legitimate character that can drive a sitcom. Nowadays The Idiot's comic relief is so overdone that it barely makes for a minor character. Yet alone giving us two idiot characters with no depth or substance to dominate the entire show. I feel bad for the viewers, I feel bad for the actors involved. The whole thing just feels like a sad attempt to remake Drake and Josh with none of the original charm or clever writing. And before we get to number one, we have the honourable mentions and one unmentionable. And the unmentionable is, of course, Fred the Show. Which will not be discussed in this video because honestly, I feel like jailing myself for discussing Fred the Show more than once. Fortunately, that's all Lucas ever did on Nickelodeon. And the honourable mentions are True Jackson VP. True Jackson VP was filmed in front of a live studio audience. Yes! An actual, real, live studio audience that shows actual emotion and expression. I still suspect they're laughing at gunpoint, but hey, it's a start. Hats off to you, True Jackson VP. Henry Danger. I really hate the canned laughter in this one particularly. And the jokes are criminally unfunny. In my opinion, it's actually much worse than Game Shakers. But I've already talked about it before, so I left it off the list. Make it pop. A pretty average Nick sitcom about a bunch of high school girls forming a K-pop band. It's not engaging at all, but you know what I do appreciate about it? No laugh track! Hooray! You have no idea how wonderful that respectful silence is after the jokes. Thumbs up, Nickelodeon! You can do it if you try. Sam and Cat. Ugh. Honestly, I like Ariana and Jeanette from Victorious and iCarly, but when you put them together, Apparently the writing quality has to be halved as well. Some people have some nice memories of this one, but personally, it certainly wasn't one I liked. Anyway, on to number one. Greetings fellow Clatonians! Hang on, hang on. We said no Fred the Show. He had a spin-off? Really? Uh, I remember now. Yeah, alright, fine, fine. Let's give it a look, because honestly, nothing else can fit number one but this. Marvin Marvin. Oh, I'm Marvin the Human Boy! I've got to slow down a bit with this one because, well, maybe it'd be more entertaining for me to launch into a tirade about how terrible, obnoxious, self-adulating and stupid this show is. And don't get me wrong, it's all those things and more. But honestly, the main problem with trying to review this one is every time I try to watch an episode, within 30 seconds I feel deep revulsion, emotional exhaustion, and have lost some of my faith in the future of children's entertainment. This show just saddens me that it ever existed, though I'm comforted at least it was cancelled within the first season. You see, there's this big void within a part of Nickelodeon's reputation. A void that is far greater than the absolute worst of Spongebob, the worst of Fairly Odd Parents, and a void even greater than any of the other Nick sitcoms. The worst of these shows are all supreme compared to the empty, vapid, pointless existence of Marvin Marvin. It's like Lucas's entire presence on Nickelodeon tapped into this primal side of the child viewer's brain. He screamed, pranced around, bathed in the glory he got for all his popularity with children, and essentially combined the worst of Nick's sitcom tropes with the worst of YouTube. And what we ended up getting was something so ugly, pandering, and stupid to watch that I honestly can't summon up the enthusiasm to tear it apart. So I hope you don't mind if I'm a little more mellow for this one. I think Lucas's continued popularity has finally broken me a little. It's not the size of your audience that matters. What matters is each individual you affect. So let's chill and take a brief look at this pile of dumpster trash together. So the story is Marvin is a 580 year old teenage alien from planet Clutoon. He has superpowers, 
including the ability to freeze, shape, shift, float. Hell, why don't we just call him Lucas Jesus? Lucas Jesus has been sent down to Earth by his parents for protection. It's like E.T., but everyone wants the alien dead. Aside from Marvin Marvin being dominated by one of the most annoying personalities on the internet. Good one, up top. It also manages to have the worst writing of all of Nickelodeon. The jokes rely mostly on potty humor, vomiting, burping, and Lucas talking about his butt. I mean, I know there are kids out there who like this me-first, self-indulgent mentality of Lucas. But for the most part, I think Nickelodeon should lead the way in offering smarter, more creative children's entertainment. And to be honest, in recent years, I think Nickelodeon's trying to do that more. Because the top three airing shows in Nickelodeon are SpongeBob, Loud House, and Paw Patrol. They make up a good 60% of Nickelodeon's current lineup. And I consider all three of these quality cartoons and it's good to see young actors at least getting a shot at shining. Some young viewers just care about seeing something kind of relatable, and the morals of most of these shows are fine, so at least it's not teaching kids anything bad. And if you were an actor in one of these shows, good on you for trying. I hope you keep practicing and go on to better, greater things. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.